The Health Subcommittee will reconvene, and we left off by having all of our witnesses uh, make their opening statements, and now we'll go to questions, starting with myself. I'll recognize myself for five minutes, and I wanted to start with Mr. Cowie, because I noted with interest your comment that price transparency in certain instances could lead to higher, not lower prices for services. Many of us have long supported price transparency in the belief that this transparency would move the market towards lower prices. For example, in the area of prescription drugs, advocating for disclosing not simply the average wholesale price or even the average manufacturing price, but disclosing what the real price is for the product, net of discounts, rebates, and other price concessions. So could you explain your comment on how in certain markets transparency could lead to a price increase as opposed to a price decrease? And what specific factors in these markets could make that happen and what we could do about it? Okay, um, All in a minute or less. No. <laughs> the best you can. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, in, in your initial comment, you, I think you, you made a reference to health care differing from TVs and, and, and car buying. Um, let me use the TV industry to illustrate the antitrust point. So big TV producers are Samsung, LG, and Sony. They sell to big distributors. Those are folks like Walmart, uh, Best Buy, Target. Uh, and us consumers looking, to, looking for competitively priced TVs will comparison shop at Walmart, Best Buy, Target, we'll use the internet, and we want information, search costs are low, and that's, that's healthy. Um, but I if transparency is the goal, if that's the goal, then, then what you would be, what you might recommend is, is Samsung, LG, Sony publicly disclose the pricing they have in deals with the big distributors like Walmart, Best Buy, and Target. Those deals are subject of head-to-head -head negotiations between very large and sophisticated players. And in antitrust, we'd rather have those, those types of deals remain private. And if we had internet posting or public filing of those pricing terms, that, that would uh, present a risk of collusion. Okay. So I'm not sure. I mean, I want to get the second question. You would advocate that we do that or, or not do that? Uh, we would advocate that we not just woodenly uh, require disclosure of all pricing terms. Uh, we have, we, we can have, when we shop for TVs, we have transparency. We can, we can compare Best Buy to Target. We can you mean the basic retail price? Yes, but when, when we're talking about the price between the manufacturer and the distributor. So you don't want that, but you correct. would, you would have, ha, you, you think the retail pricing should be transparent, but not the, the larger wholesale deals. That's yeah. what you're saying. Okay. All right, let me ask um, Mr. Summer a question. Um, the health, well, you actually comment on this, but I wanted to give you a little more information or give us a little more information on how the health care reform legislation recently passed um, took steps towards greater transparency. And I'm not suggesting that we don't need to do more, otherwise we wouldn't be having this hearing today. But just give us um, what, talk to me about what steps the hospitals will be taking to implement the requirements under the health reform legislation that would make them uh, more transparent or more meaningful to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what we would see happening under that bill is uh, more comprehensive information available that's right now available in some states and not all states, much like I spoke about Colorado, and I think the bill will provide opportunities for patients and their families to get access to. Well, let me look to you, so I know I keep cutting you off, but it, it requires uniform definitions, a description of all covered items and services, including exceptions, the cost sharing for benefits, the out-of-pocket payment structure, a fax label that has common benefit scenarios, allowing people to compare coverage and prices for a typical episode. Uh, it requires charity hospitals to charge uninsured individuals no more than what is generally billed to insure patients for the same services. You, you want to get into, a l <laughs> I mean, I don't have a lot of time, obviously, but just some idea how you're going to implement these things, if you could. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that what we're looking for and what will come out of that is, is for this information to be available at the state level. 
so that the as you mentioned in your remarks it will provide some standardization of what that information is some common definitions and then the the information related to both the charges and the length of stay will then be available for consumers to look and check also i think the patient safety information the quality information and i think it's important to look at them differently because people can check out quality and patient safety information at any time but the pricing information is obviously related to a need for procedure and that will vary very much by the individual patient in the severity of their illness is and if are the hospitals going to have a problem doing this uh, no, sir. Uh, in fact, already in uh, over 40 states uh, in the country, it is available right now. Uh, and it, you heard two examples here in Wisconsin and Colorado. So, so it's really more a question of uniformity than anything else at this point. Yes, sir. It is available, and uh, th we see no problem with making it available. Uh, and we think that would be a positive step towards transparency. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me say for the record, I think that recently uh, passed health care law is, is an unmitigated disaster, and we are going to go off the cliff. Um, and let me, let me uh, move in a direction. Um, let's talk about transparency. Did, we know, did you know that the transparency provisions only rely to those who purchase their health insurance through the new state-based exchanges? Did you know that, Mr. Summer? <laughs> that the transparency provisions in the, in the law only pertain to those who purchase their insurance in the new state-based exchanges. Uh, yes, Congressman, um, they are, those apply to health plans. What I'm talking about, what we're here. Um, from yeah, the but the question was on the law. The law says transparency only for the new exchanges that there'll be transparency for. So I'm on, that's not my main issue, but I just want to counter what my colleague was talking about transparency, the, the transparency provisions but why we had this hearing is because we blew away transparency provisions. We didn't address transparency provisions in the, in the law. Let me go to Mr. Gardner real quick. Um, I want to ask about in your, in your Alaska fishing days, um, how many different businesses did you have an aggregate cost of over $600 per year with? Well, um, my last company grew from a startup over 23 years to $125 million in sales. So how many businesses, so let's say when you first started, how many, you know, if you just had a boat going out to fish, how many different, as a small business, self-employed, how many businesses would you deal with the aggregate payments to of over $600? Well, the, the average commercial fisherman like I was would have one to six crewmen who legally are self-employed. What about gas? What about feeding? You yeah, you buy a, a lot of stuff, probably a food. Th third of your expenses, you buy groceries, water, fuel every week. Petroleum. Yeah. A lot of different businesses that you would pay at least $600 to annually. That's correct. Um, as a small business, and if you had to file a 1099 for each transaction, would you feel that that's a, an additional business obligation? Well, we do, um, as fish processors, we had to file um, every time we purchase fish from a fisherman, you know, every... No, but I'm talking about for the food for your crewmen, for the gasoline you purchase, for the repair of your net. No, we didn't have to file. No, you do, but you, the point is you will, as a small businessman under this law, the health care law, an agri if, if you have a contractual obligation of over $600, you have to file a 1099. That's why we're going to hire 15,000 more IRS agents. Mr. Summer, how many in an individual hospital, how many individual contracts or payments out of over $600 does an average hospital have in the state of Colorado? Mr. Chairman, I have no idea. Uh, there probably are hundreds. Given the potential paperwork nightmare this provision could become, would you commit to surveying your members to determine this figure? We would certainly be willing to talk to you about that, but Mr. Chairman, they also. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a ranking member. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Mr. Ranking. This is the chairman. Congressman, thank you. Um, the positive side for our. No, I'm, I'm, what, what I'm asking is, I, want, I would like for your help to, de to, de to uh, determine all the c individual contracts. Here's an example. If you cut grass in America and you're a kid, and you have $600 of, of gas bills to a retail location, 
you're going to be required to provide that gas station at 1099 under this bill. Now, just multiply that by the size of the business. And that's why the projection is 15,000 more IRS employees. Let me move to Medicare and Medicaid real quick. You've heard us talk about the chief actuary of CMS and his projections um, that uh, suggest that roughly 15% of Part A providers would become unprofitable. Do you have an I identification? Do you, first of all, agree with that number? And which 15% of the hospitals of, of Colorado will basically close because of this new health care law? I have, I have not, Congressman, read that report, but I think... Uh, no, the CMS actuary did. The, the actuary for the, for the Center right. of Medicare and Medicaid Services, their, that's their projection based upon us taking $500 billion out of Medicare. Okay. Wouldn't that be an effect, uh, affect the cost of reimbursement to the hospitals in Colorado? Congressman, we're so thrilled that there will be 32 million more people covered by that plan that that's really the focus of our uh, attention at the moment. The uh, so you're, un you're unconcerned about the $500 billion cuts in Medicare? Um, or the Congress trillion dollars additional in taxation? I think the net gain from that legislation is very positive for Colorado. Well, you're, you're speaking the policy line, and I appreciate that. I uh, respectfully disagree. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. I have to admit that when, I, when you were asking Mr. Gardner about the fisheries in Alaska, I turned around. I, I thought I was back on my – before I chaired the Health Subcommittee, I was the ranking member on fisheries, wildlife, and the oceans. <laughs> And I said, Am I, I, I was wondering what was going on there <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, with due respect to uh, my colleague from Illinois, I would like to point out that Section 2715 of the health care bill that he is referring to specifically applies not just to those plans that are part of the exchange, but to all group health insurance plans, which make up the vast majority of health care that's provided in this country. And so the, the point, I think, was not um, accurate. Uh, I would like to start, um, Mr. Cowie, with you. Um, I know that you're, you've spent a good deal of your life dealing with antitrust issues. You, you, your statement, you talked about concerns about price fixing and collusion, which is always uh, an issue in antitrust cases. But one of the things we know about this marketplace is that it differs from many other marketplaces that would be considered a free market environment, which is not constrained by other external forces. We all know that the 800-pound gorilla in health care payment is Medicare. And we know that Medicare controls prices in every jurisdiction in this country because we see it from the hospitals and doctors that we represent. We also know that most private pay plans are driven from some derivative of a Medicare pricing formula from a baseline and then a multiplier. So I don't understand how giving consumers more information about the cost of health care in that environment is similar to giving people information about TVs and other consumer products at their price. Can you explain that? Um, uh, Congressman Braley, there's um, health care sectors is distinguishable because Medicare and Medicaid plays an important role. Um, but, you know, at the FTC, we wanted to make sure consumers got the benefit of vigorous price competition, so competition between drug manufacturers, competition between hospital systems, competition between large physician groups remains important in health care just like it does in other sectors. Um, where where publication of pricing can become problematic if, is if you're dealing with parts of the industry where um, you know so commercial suppliers are negotiating with other large commercial suppliers. So in many many regions of the, many cities in this country, there's only two or three hospital systems, and those two or three hospital systems are negotiating pricing with Blue Cross, with Aetna, or Cigna. And those are, you know, those are uh, big boys um, negotiating hard. And in general, and in our trust, our view is if, you know, if you're playing poker, you shouldn't uh, have to show your cards. And you, you actually get better outcomes if they're negotiating head-to-head -head privately. Well, that may be true, but I think you're focusing on, on primarily urban areas. If you're talking about 
the potential of three competitive um, systems within a marketplace because in rural parts of the country you may be lucky to have one hospital in your uh, community. And one of, the, one of the other related problems we know, and this came out extensively during the health care debate, was in many states like mine, 80 percent of the private coverage is written by one or two companies. And in that case, you have an unnatural negotiating environment because you've got a dominant player that has much more leverage than the people they're negotiating with. And, and so, uh, 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 Mr. Summer, I'd like you to comment on that, you know, because you represent a, a vast group of hospitals uh, from large urban hospitals to hospitals that are in rural communities and may be dependent upon a lot of other uh, facts that are affecting what type of services they can provide. Do you believe that more transparency in pricing is going to hurt the medical consumers in your state? Uh, no, Congressman. I think that the transparency that takes place at the state level where they provide the range of uh, charges for certain diagnoses that are adjusted do help patients give them some indication of the ranges. However, the real issue is what health insurance plan they belong to. And, and like your question, like the question and the answer is, there are places where there are not choices of providers. That's where you need to go. And so it gives a range of what's available, but there's really not a lot of choice on price. Mr. Ruglin, I want to talk to you about um, your statement about the commitment to transparency that you talked about in your opening statement. Uh, driven by our strong belief we must change to sustain our obligation to care for the community. You talked about how quality improved as a, an, as a related aspect of a commitment to pricing and uh, to transparency in the way you price the services you provide and also emphasizing getting the most efficiency into the system. One of the things that um, was mentioned was a reference to taking $500 billion out of Medicare over the 10-year cost that CBO scored this bill. And yet many healthcare economists estimate that each year there is somewhere between $500 and $700 billion of inefficient or wasted services within the, the healthcare delivery system. So I'd like you to comment on how becoming more efficient and becoming more transparent promotes quality outcomes, promotes efficiency in the system, and, and achieves the goal that we all are looking for. Okay, uh, let me start off by saying it's our, it's our view there's a trillion dollars a year of waste within the medical system, the healthcare system. 50% of the system is redundant in waste. Uh, when we started working on uh, the issue of how will we sustain our, our uh, health care in our community, this was about seven years ago, uh, I like to say it this way, we put a bet on the fact that we were going the model was going to need to change. It would not sustain itself as it, as it operated, that over time the patient would have more and more voice in what, uh, what their health care decisions were. And in order for us to be positioned in order to deal with that, we had to do several things. One is there had to be uh, more information available, meaningful information. The first step was to uh, work with the hospitals in Wisconsin to gather data on cost and quality. And then we also had to go into our, our own system and change the way we did things so that, the, that uh, uh, we could redesign the process to remove the waste. Now, one of the things we found out was that as we as we as we understand and had transparency about price and and quality, and some of that information is in my written testimony, and we posted it in the in the hospitals and in the clinics, we got better. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we found out that people working in healthcare don't want to be at the bottom of the rank. They they want to be they want to be good. They're committed passionately to what they're working in, and they want to be better. And their response to posting this data was that we got better. So as we mo moved to change our processes, our quality got better. And that was uh, what I was trying to get at in my testimony. Thank you, I'll yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask uh, unanimous consent just for one minute to uh, uh, address this language of law that was raised by, um, the, uh, to my friend from Iowa, the out-of-pocket cost transparency provision in Section 10,104 only applies to insurance purchased through the exchanges. Section 10,104 amends Section 1311E 
of the bill which is the exchange section which is the exact important reason why the green barton bill needs to be addressed because it it will address transparency across the board to all insurers thank you you're back gentleman from pennsylvania mr pitts thank you mr chairman uh, mr summer the health care uh, law that we just passed imposes a uh, two point three percent tax on medical devices when they're sold are hospitals uh, purchasers of medical devices um, y yes sir they do do you think it is likely or not likely at all that the medical device manufacturers will pass the tax through to the purchaser of the product in the uh, form of an increased sales price Congressman, we are hopeful that does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> but you think it probably will? Uh, I can't comment on that. You can't. Okay. Well, Maybe. would it be fair to say that the tax on medical devices will increase the cost of procedures at your hospitals because the cost of medical devices used in those procedures is higher? Congressman, certainly all the components of a procedure um, including the uh, medical devices are factored into the cost of uh, what that procedure would cost. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Herslinger, uh, what are the proper roles of the government and the private sector in ensuring Americans have access to the information they need to make good decision? Is there any information that if released could lead to collusion and increased costs for consumers? Should the government insist on keeping that kind of information private or pursue other uh, responses? Well, the danger of collusion is, of course, great in oligopolistic industries. If there is free entry in the market, if Mr. Kelly and I colluded on price, then Mr. Summer, Mr. Rugland, Mr. Gardner could all enter the market and cut our prices. So the only circumstances where we could collude effectively is if he and I are the only participants in the market. In most of the American economy, that is not so. Healthcare, for example, is the healthcare delivery system is hugely fragmented and famous for its fragmentation. We have over 700,000 physicians, over 5,000 hospitals. The danger of collusion, which may be there in the pharmaceutical industry, where a pharmaceutical company may hold a patent and be a virtual monopoly, is not so in the rest of the delivery system. And in the rare cases where there's been transparency of prices and quality, Prices have improved and quality has gone up in well, health care like the rest of the economy. What is the full range of information that Americans need to make good decisions about their health care? Clearly, they need to know the prices that they are going to pay. And the Indian hospitals, which are the hospitals in the country of India, which are creating themselves to compete with the American hospital industry. They quote full prices. So if you were to go to India and say, I needed open heart surgery, they wouldn't say to you, well, we can't give you a price. They would give you a price and they stick with that price. So clearly you need price information but that's not enough. You need to know what the quality is as well. And um, when it comes to insurance, we also need to know how good is that insurer in dealing with people like me? Do they hassle people like me or are they great to people like me? How great are they to the doctors that I deal with? That's the kind of information we need. And is it preferable for the government to uh, empower Americans with good information about the quality and cost of their health care or to task government bureaucrats with determining which procedures and treatments are cost effective and medically effective? I think the models that we have in transparency elsewhere in the economy, for example, in the SEC, the SEC has the power to enforce transparency 
but it has ceded that power to professionals, in this case, the accounting profession, who are not stakeholders, they're not interested in preserving truth, they're solely interested in doing a good job of measurement. That's a very good model to follow. Finally, Mr. Holden, uh, I understand Medicare pays ambulatory surgery centers about 58% of the hospital outpatient rate and that beneficiaries can save even more with their co-pays. What are the current obstacles to informing patients and other consumers of these potential savings and how would the uh, Patient Right to Know Act create a more informed con consumer? Yeah, the biggest obstacle is lack of a forum, uh, lack of a vehicle for the communication. Right now it relies on the communication between the patient and the physician as a general rule and uh, even among physicians those are facts not well known. Not facts not well known in almost any forum in the country. Okay, my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank our panel for their patience between votes and everything else. It's uh, sometimes hard to actually get a full hearing in in a day, even with one panel. Uh, Mr. Summer, both Congressman Burgess and our original co-sponsors on uh, the Health Care Price Transparency Act, HR uh, 4803, uh, it's a state-based approach building on what we have. Uh, could you discuss the difference between the state-based price transparency system, such as your system in Colorado, and uh, a system, say, we would house at the Health and Human Services here in Washington or HHS? Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Um, Congressman, the, the all decisions for health care are local, and the experience has been that a system that is built locally at the state level, and there are plenty of models to look at, um, are much more useful and helpful to patients and their families. So we believe that the state-based system, which allows the hospitals to put the information in and aggregate it as it's being done uh, in almost 41 states, would provide the better information uh, for, the, for the consumers. The uh, H.R. 3590, the Patient Protection Act, created a system of state-based health, health insurance exchanges. And do you believe setting a federal floor on states adhere to with regard to price transparency is a logical way to <coughs> proceed with price transparency, even though those, those exchanges will be state-based? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't really see well, the question coming. The, the bill created a system of state-based health ex insurance exchanges. And is it better, would it be better to have a federal, for example, minimum standards, which we're going to have for those exchanges anyway? That's what current law. But transferring that into transparency, should we have some type of minimum amount of transparency that all states would have using the best of the 31 states we have, for example? I think some federal guidelines, some uniform definitions would certainly help for the comparability of, of that information, yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, I say that because just a few days ago, the governor of Texas decided he wasn't going to participate, and I'm never so thankful that we put in there that if uh, we will have a state exchange in Texas that it will be without state participation uh, because obviously our small businesses and folks need it. But uh, you referenced the need for a study of consumer-friendly pricing language or common terms or some of the sort of agreement among hospital providers on pricing language. Do you have any suggestions on the study or implementation using these common terms? And it seems that universally common pricing language should be regulated or guidance should be issued by HHS so we would know again, cross state lines, whether it's a state exchange on the type of policy we're purchasing or the information that we're being provided, whether you're in Texas or Louisiana or New York. Yeah, I, uh, Congressman, I think you very much to your point. I think there needs to be some comparability and some standardization uh, because borders are very porous when it comes to purchasing health care and using health care facilities. Uh, th there's a distinction in our mind with borders, but that's not how people buy health care, and so there would need to be that. Um, standardization of some comparability between the terms and the information. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Holden, how would the quality reporting requirement in the Patient's Right to Know Act regarding apples to apples comparison of quality metrics across sites of care create more useful quality information for a patient considering an outpatient surgery at an uh, ASC or a hospital? And does the ASC industry have uh, what are they doing now on quality reporting? Because I think we know hospitals are having to do it. Are, are the outpatient uh, surgical centers also doing it? 
Yeah, so we, as I mentioned, we're reporting voluntarily about 20% of uh, centers in the U.S. through the ASC Quality Collaborative posted online at ASCQuality.org. Uh, we, uh, in addition, we formed the ASC Quality Collaborative to pursue this initiative on our own, uh, assuming that there may not be a forum like we have here today to discuss it and take it to the next level. So it's something that we've been pushing on internally. And I think the first part of your question is what would it take uh, to to create these apples apples comparisons because consumers need both pricing information, but they also need to know quality so they can make that informed decision. Right. Well, obviously, you need to, as I think it's men mentioned several times, the pricing information across the modalities. Uh, and, you know, there are the uh, NQF data is available today, but we'd need to expand the data set. You know, you would need to tailor it to a consumer friendly, a consumer relevant set of metrics. Uh, like if you or I were sitting down trying to decide where to get a cataract surgery, you would want to know, you wouldn't need that many data points, much like I think the example was given on the car if you had the you know if you had the various consumer reports and uh, repair records and things like that in similar vein you could make those decisions pretty quickly well and I know most people and I know in my own family if if uh, their doctor recommends some type of surgery they're going to typically go where the where the doctor suggests but I think we're going to empower a lot more consumers to say if I need a bypass I can tell you there's lots of facilities in Houston Texas that can provide bypass surgery and both having the quality and the information there, particularly if they're having to pay, you know, their 20% copay. Uh, we know seniors now uh, are concerned because they have to come up with either your Medigap or that 20% on your Medicare. Uh, a lot of folks, though, uh, below 65, you know, don't do that. So uh, I think the information we would provide by this legislation would help. So there's no forum today. No, there's no place to go for that information across for the outpatient platforms. Uh, the best we could think of was doing it amongst ourselves, but for it to be correct, it needs to compare across all modalities, and we don't have the power to make that happen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a particularly difficult task because I only have five minutes, and although we heard from Dr. Kagan in the first panel, there's no doctor on the second panel, so I feel obligated to be that doctor on the second panel, so I may ask myself a few questions and respond because I think the doctor's perspective is important to have before the committee. I, I'll just have to say one thing, too. Uh, Atul Gawande, who before he became famous for traveling to McAllen, Texas, also did some other travels, and I think it was 2004, wrote an article for the New Yorker called The Bell Curve. And I know I've heard Dr. Herzlinger speak of issues like this before, but to have the actual report card, if you will, on hospitals, on doctors, so that Consumers, patients can, can make the best choice if they are supposed to have a whatever, knee replacement, what have you, but they can then, uh, you know, maybe they don't want necessarily the best price, but they want to go to the place with the best results for knee surgery. Actually, the article on the bell curve that Dr. Gawande wrote was on the treatment, the long-term treatment and management of cystic fibrosis and how the very meticulous management of these patients could actually translate into years added on to the end of life expectancy. So uh, it's, n it's, a, it's a theoretic point, but it also has some practical applications. And uh, Mr. Summer and Dr. Herslinger, I wonder if you could just comment on that because that, that seems to be the direction of what we're discussing today. I mean, what about the concept of having a report card for your hospitals and, and, and for physicians? Well, Congressman, uh, I'll speak for the hospital side only, and I would say we could not agree with you more. In fact, that kind of information, um, we work with the state of Colorado, and there are over three dozen quality measures available today uh, on our webpage that you can essentially slice and dice them any way to do any kinds of comparisons among hospitals and procedures. So we fully support that. I think the basis for that is best done at the state level, but that, as you said, in combination with the pricing information is important information. Uh, and so we have moved forward with uh, and in collaboration with the state of Colorado to put that information and make it available today. Well, thank you. And of course, I know the physician's perspective and some pushback that would come from my community, but Dr. Herslinger, let me even ask you as a, a, from someone in the business world or even perhaps the patient's perspective, what, what about this type of model? Well, clearly patients love information. Uh, consumers love information. That's what's made consumer reports so powerful. 
there was just that this New York Times or Wall Street Journal article yesterday lauding consumer reports and other information intermediaries, people like J.B. Heller, who's a real person, Bloomberg, those are people who take information that's provided by the government and they translate it and make it useful for consumers and they are well rewarded for their efforts. So consumers, when you look at surveys of what do they want in health care, one of the primary things they want from the government is they want transparency. I'd like to comment on whether the transparency should be state-based or federal-based. There are many good reasons for doing it by state, but the Dartmouth Atlas shows tremendous variations in the quality of care across states and across institutions. It would make sense for somebody who lives um, in Wisconsin on the border of Michigan or on adjacent states to be able to have information so that they could compare the, the regional quality, data. Uh, the quality of information of uh, health care and price of health care, not only within their own state, but in neighboring markets. Okay. And, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I just can't help myself. I've got to ask Mr. Kelly some questions, and I found myself intensely agreeing, intensely disagreeing with you as you as you gave your testimony. In fact, it reminded me of why in my first term I submitted an amendment to defund the Federal Trade Commission in one of our appropriations bills <laughs> because of what you were doing to physicians and in, in, uh, in, in their inability to compete with insurance companies because we were never allowed to negotiate, but of course insurance companies could do so freely. They could collude freely on, on price, but if doctors, even there was a hint or a whiff that we, were, that we were talking to each other, we would be hauled up before your commission, eventually cleared, but not before we spent one or two hundred thousand dollars, which we couldn't afford. But on the issue of not having data up there because it could lead to an unfair advantage, to a third party payer, I actually do support that notion and I worry that if I put my price for delivering a baby up on the internet that, I'd you, that I'll give Cigna, that United and Blue Cross will quickly say, hey, look what this guy will do this for and they'll be right back in with a new contract that reflects that lower level. But the real problem is not Cigna and Blue Cross, the big problem is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the sustainable growth rate formula which every insurance company in the country almost pegs to the C SGR. And as a consequence, when we cut doctor's pay 5%, 6%, 21%, which we're threatening to do at the end of this month, every insurance company out there in the country is salivating and, and rubbing their hands together because now they're going to be able to offer new contracts based on that percentage of the, of the SGR formula. So really, shouldn't the FCC go after CMS with all the vigor that it attacked physicians a few years ago? And I know I'm out of time, but I'd like to hear a response. Yeah, uh, uh, Congressman, I'd, I'd uh, need to study that issue and, and get back to you to, to address it in intelligently. Oh, I'll, accept, <laughs> I'll accept that deferral. It, 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 is, uh, it, it does become, and you know, this is a very, very complex problem. We didn't. I didn't get to the question the uh, ambulatory surgery center, but we have the whole issue of physician-owned hospitals, which we've essentially outlawed in the health care bill. And yet, if you want the best bang for your buck, if I'm uninsured and I need a moderate procedure done, I can get that procedure for one-tenth of the cost that I can get it in the hospital if I go to an ambulatory surgery center. The doctor's fee is likely to be the same in each facility because it doesn't matter to them. They're indifferent as to where the facili what facility they use. But the, the big cost driver is the hospital versus the ambulatory surgery center. Not all facilities are equal. And unfortunately, in the construct of this bill, we really didn't delve into why those differences exist and what we might do to mitigate them. And Mr. Gardner, I, I appreciate your comments as well. You talked about having the federalized exchange so that there would be a, a you wouldn't be beholden to state issues. Uh, I just wonder why we weren't able to ever talk seriously about selling insurance across state lines because that too would make sense. Now we have the federal government doing it for us. We might have had the private sector competing for us. Now we have the federal government, which competes with no one. I submit my previous issue on the SGR, but now we have the federal government that competes with no one setting those prices across the country, and we may have gotten the absolute worst of both worlds. I didn't get to talk about Medicaid, but I appreciate the extra time, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
I had a unanimous consent request from Mr. Shimkus to enter into the record the statement of Tim Estes and Travis Gentry, co-founders of Financial Healthcare Systems. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, nothing, Mr. Chairman, except for um, uh, uh, instructions to the panelists that if we have follow-up questions. Oh, yeah. Let me mention that. Um, I, I'll remind the members that you may submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses, and those are submitted to the clerk normally within the next 10 days. So you may get additional um, written questions from us within 10 days. The clerk will notify you, and, and obviously we'd like you to answer as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, yes. Let me just ask unanimous consent uh, that this op-ed that appeared in May of 2005 in the Washington Times that was so well written and so well constructed and quoted Dr. Reinhardt that that be inserted. Uh, reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. Let's look at it. That was by you. Yeah, that's a point. Oh, okay. <laughs> Without objection, so ordered. By the way, I was. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen, let me, let me thank uh, all of you for being here today. This is a very important issue. Um, as I said in the beginning, we did have a legislative hearing on all three bills today because uh, we know it's important and there's certainly a possibility that we would move forward uh, with legislation. We're not clear on that yet, but obviously today helped us in that regard a great deal. So thank you very much, really, for your testimony. And without objection, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned.